Pokemon fans, Tomashi here. As many of you know, recently Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire were announced as remakes of the original Gen 3 games, which has sparked a lot of discussion about Gen 3, mostly pertaining to what people think the new games will be like. But I remember a time when on just about any Pokemon forum I went to, simply bringing up Gen 3 would start a huge debate over which is the best Pokemon generation, since it was the gen that most fans have a love-hate relationship with. And people got really heated about these discussions, resorting to name-calling, even inventing new insults to go with each gen. Gen 1ers, Joe Toddlers, Hoenn Babies, Sinnoh Fetuses, just about any gen had their own unique little derogatory term. Now I personally don't think that any one gen is definitively the best. Each has things that they do right, and things other gens do better. But today I thought I'd share with you my own personal stance on where each Pokemon generation stacks up with me, and why, from least favorite to favorite of all time. I've played from the beginning, so I got to experience each generation as it was new, so that will probably flavor my perspective a bit. To be clear, remakes of the old games belong to the generation they were released in, not to the generation of the game that they're remaking. So without further ado, these are my top 6 Pokemon generations, at least of right now. Number 6, Generation 4. Sorry to say to Sinnoh fans out there, Generation 4 was my least favorite. Of the 5 games in Gen 4, Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, Heart Gold, and Soul Silver, I only really disliked 2.5 of them, and for a long time the other two were my favorite Pokemon games of all time. But my dislike of Diamond and Pearl strong enough to knock it down several pegs on this list, I'm sorry to say. So what did it do wrong exactly? Well, many things. To start out with, the gameplay is extremely slow and tedious, not only due to the game actually running slowly, but also because of bad pacing, bad region design, and a handful of new annoying mechanics that thankfully never made a return. The story is also weak to the point of why even bother, and the characters are flat and unmemorable. So let's break this down a little. When I say the game is badly paced, I mean there's not a lot of sense of progress. It takes several hours of gameplay between earning your 3rd and 4th gym badges, and then once you earn your 4th badge, you basically do nothing but earn badges from that point on. The journey the player takes in this game is like a long, tedious trek uphill and then a rapidly snowballing down. Most of the gym leaders pass by so fast I end up forgetting that they exist. A long stretch of doing nothing in the middle of the game makes it feel a lot longer than it really is, which of course is only exasperated by the already slow and plodding pace that the game runs at. Add on to this a region with a huge number of towns with no gyms, a bunch of towns that look identical, long irritating routes in between all of them, with terrain to cross like mud and snow and fog that slows things down even further, and what you get is a game that's not only very slow, long, and plodding, but also not very memorable. Not helped at all by the fact that Team Galactic were a huge step down from Team Aqua and Magma, and that none of the characters were compelling or well-rounded. Team Galactic, in the end, accomplished less than any other enemy team. They didn't have interesting motives, they were basically a cult that weren't even all on the same page, and their actions didn't make any sense at all. One of the encounters you have with them involves them holding a guy hostage in order to steal honey. You know, the thing you can find on the ground all over the damn place, and would be much easier to find themselves. And this ends up having nothing to do with the end goal of the team anyway. It doesn't build up to anything. None of the actions they take during the longest part of the game end up mattering. The climax just kind of happens during that rush of forward momentum at the very end of the game. Gen 4 wasn't all bad though. It did introduce the much needed physical special split, online Wi-Fi battles, power items for EV training, and it has a lot of things left over from Gen 3 that never survived into Gen 5, like contests and sort of secret bases, which is nice. Platinum fixed some of the problems with Diamond and Pearl, and Heart Gold and Soul Silver were charming little love letters to older fans with frivolous but fun things like Pokemon Companions and the Game Boy Player music. Unfortunately though, these things just weren't enough to redeem the most painfully boring adventure in a Pokemon game to date for me. I know Diamond and Pearl have their fans and are nostalgic to a lot of people, but I'm just not one of them. Sorry. Number 5, Generation 1. I don't actively dislike Gen 1 quite like I do Gen 4. There's nothing super wrong with it, it just hasn't aged well. And the sheer amount of times I've played this thing, either for fun or for footage, mostly for footage, has kind of broken my pair of the nostalgia goggles a lot of people see this game through. Mechanically, it's a mess in every way possible, riddled with bugs, not all of which are fun like Missing No, and it's extremely unbalanced. The Gen 1 Pokemon in particular haven't aged well in my opinion, mostly because of their simple and similar designs, and it's pretty slow to play just with the walking speed and lack of menu shortcuts that cropped up in later games. Kanto does have its charm though. I love the rural feeling that you don't see most of the new regions, and how non-linear and open-ended it is compared to the new games. 
where they basically railroad you in the most glaringly obvious way possible. And though I may be a minority on this, I kind of like that the story with Team Rocket is kind of minimal and not really the focus of the game. They just kind of show up and get in your way. You're not saving the world or anything. So the focus is more on your journey with your Pokemon than stopping them. The characters are simple, sure, but since they're not really the focus, it works far better than the stories in most of the Pokemon games that followed it. Since it was the game that started the franchise, of course it's going to be the most simple, since every other game has been built on top of it. This simplicity is really charming and refreshing, but at the same time, there's just not a lot to it. Now with other better Pokemon games to play, it's just not that high on my list. Number 4. Generation 2 For a game that has such a crazy turbulent development, it turned out surprisingly well. Sure, there are still a few issues, the level scaling is all kinds of screwed up once you make it about halfway through Johto, and the decision to include both a Dragon-type Gym Leader and Champion always baffled me, when they only had two fully evolved Dragon-type Pokemon at the time. Some people also take issue with the distribution of wild Pokemon, with a lot of the newer Pokemon only appearing in Kanto in the post-game, but that never really bothered me too much. It meant that there is still more to discover even after you were back in familiar territory. But as a sequel to Gen 1, it did everything it needed to. It fixed most of the biggest flaws with its predecessor, including the balance and bugginess, it added tons of innovative features like breeding and playable female characters, and in terms of just how much content there is in the game, few beat this one. I do quite like Johto's design, atmosphere, and of course the music. Updated Kanto makes me feel more nostalgic than Gen 1's Kanto because it shows signs of time passing, and I thought the colorful new Pokemon that were introduced made nice use of the Game Boy Color's graphical capabilities, minus all those pesky baby Pokemon, of course. Team Rocket is far more interesting as an ex-evil organization struggling to exist without their leader than they ever were as a functioning one, and overall I felt it had a nice balance of villain team story and the focus on the Pokemon journey. Unfortunately, I've really gotten to play through this one the least out of all the Pokemon games, mostly due to the limited lifespan of the internal battery. Yes, I know you can replace them, guys, that's really not the point. So, anyway, it doesn't have much nostalgic value to me. Like Gen 1, there are better Pokemon games to play at this point, but for what it was, it was really quite good. Number 3, Generation 6. This one is a bit of a mixed bag for me, and since it hasn't really ended yet, it's only in this slot tentatively. There are a lot of things about it I really like. The updates to the breeding system, the accessibility and efficiency of UV training, Pokemon and me, customizable trainers, all great things I really love. I like Kalos as a region, I like almost all the new Pokemon, both design-wise and balance-wise, and I liked that they even went to the trouble of updating some of the older Pokemon to make them more useful again. Friend Safari was a godsend when it came to getting hidden abilities and breeding parents, and the graphical enhancements managed to retain the art style I love while updating it for modern systems. But as a follow-up to Gen 5, it was really kind of odd. It feels kind of like Game Freak took the criticism it got over black and white and decided to do a 180. It's more like a sequel to Gen 4 than anything, as it has a lot of the same problems, though since it runs faster, they're not quite as crippling here. Team Flare is written almost exactly like Team Galactic, where the grunts aren't on the same page at all as the people in charge, and not much they do throughout the story builds up to the finale. It also has the same weird pacing problem where there's a long stretch of gameplay between the third and fourth badges, and then rapid fire badge after badge after badge for the rest of the game. It doesn't have much at all in common with Gen 5, which had a huge story emphasis and vivid characters. Gen 6 has more characters than any other Pokemon game, but devotes hardly any time to any of them, so none of them feel fleshed out besides AZ, the characters involved in the Looker story, and Shauna, who's kind of foisted on you as this weird unisex love interest. The problems with the story wouldn't be so bad if there were anything left to do at all in the game once you finished it. I'm just kind of hoping that Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire help redeem this gen a little, and that we get something to the effect of a third version to give us more post-game. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't, so I'm sure Gen 6 will rise in my estimation later. Just so far, it's been kind of meh. Number 2. Generation 3. So Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald have a lot of nostalgic and sentimental value to me, because they were the Pokemon games that completely changed my life. So admittedly, this one is up so high partially for those reasons, and not based solely on the merit of the generation itself. Though I do think Ruby and Sapphire are still good games. It is a personal list after all, so I can't remove my biases from it. But I'll do my best to try and explain what it means to me, and do it justice. Of all seven games in Generation 3, Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald are the only ones I really like, but unlike Gen 4, this time the good outweighs the bad for me. Ruby and Sapphire were a big departure from the two gens that came before them, and were really a fresh start for the series. They introduced a more involved story, and more developed characters, but never lost sight of that personal journey that makes Pokemon so special. Ruby and Sapphire is the perfect balance of story-driven narrative and player-constructed narrative. The stakes were higher than they ever were before, with the player saving the world rather than stopping individual crimes, 
but the story didn't take priority over everything else like it did in later Pokemon games. And what story there was was really quite good. Magma and Aqua are, to date, the enemy teams that have accomplished the most out of all of them. They actually achieved their goal, only to realize what horrible mistakes they had made and grew from it. Something you rarely see in a modern Pokemon game. The region's design itself was integral to the story, with half of Hoenn being land and half of it being water, which I know some people don't like, but to me it really works. And though many people thought Magma and Aqua's goals were silly to begin with, I feel like they work a lot better than people give them credit for. It's not just silly people arguing over landscaping, it's extreme activism, almost on the same level of wanting to liberate Pokemon like Team Plasma. They want to change the environment for Pokemon's benefit, even if that means wiping out all the human life in the region. And speaking of Hoenn, the region is gorgeous. No other game has as many varied environments to explore. From small towns to big cities, to dense forests, to tropical islands, to port towns, to deserts, to volcanoes, to jungles, to underwater caverns. Secret bases, mixing records, contests, gave you things to do with your Pokemon besides earn badges. And as a whole, there's more I like about Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald than any other Pokemon games. Unfortunately, they just missed the number one slot simply by virtue of being outdated mechanically, and because the other games in their generation do bring them down a little. Fire Red, Leaf Green, Coliseum, and XD all got their own in-depth reviews on my channel, so I won't be a broken record and repeat myself too much. But the fact that you need to completely beat 4 out of the 7 games in this generation to complete the Pokedex is a little ridiculous. As someone who actually enjoys catching them all, not being able to trade between them until unlocking the National Dex was a really silly restriction, and one that thankfully never plagued any future Pokemon games. Gen 3 as a whole might have been kind of a rough transitional patch for the franchise, but it has a very special place in my heart. And, judging by what's left, I'm sure you already have guessed it, the number one Pokemon generation is... Generation 5. For a generation that's my favorite of all time, I actually have quite a lot of negative stuff to say about it. And since I never plan to review it fully, I won't get a chance to get this stuff off my chest otherwise. So let's get that out of the way first. Innova as a region is kind of lame. Game Freak was apparently so worried about little kids getting lost or confused, and not finishing the game, that they designed this region in the most linear fashion possible. It's literally a circle that the player travels around in a clockwise direction in black and white one, and it's got four very straight, very empty bridges where the player has nothing to do but cross to the other side. The story was a bigger focus than ever in a Pokemon game, and while a lot of things about it work really well, there's kind of too much buildup and not enough payoff. I realize things were left intentionally vague because, well, that's kind of the point, isn't it? But with just how much buildup there was around Team Plasma and Pokemon Liberation and all of these characters, the ending leaves me feeling unsatisfied. Probably because one of the big things built up throughout the game is that the player is the middle ground between truth and ideals. And ultimately, the player is given no way to express this or make any kind of meaningful choice, or really do anything that impacts the narrative. The player is told they're the hero, but everything instrumental to the plot is done by other characters. But honestly, having recently replayed it, the story in Black and White 1 isn't as bad as I initially felt it was. It certainly gave me more to think about than any other Pokemon game, and the many, many round and real feeling characters really are what make the story work. Sharon, Bianca, especially N, are all really interesting. And the fact that N isn't the straw man gets it's set up to be makes the whole thing feel a lot more balanced, even if one side of the argument is ultimately given more attention. Black and White 2 fixed a ton of the things they didn't like about Black and White 1, like a more interesting region design, more diverse wild Pokemon, and it retained a lot of the things I liked about the first game too, like the fleshed out and real feeling characters, and it even introduced some new ones that are equally as awesome. But it also gets a few things wrong, mostly the main plot. It kinda makes my head hurt how dumb it is. So your rival Hugh has a sister who had a purloin, right? Why is Hugh going after the purloin? Why not the sister? Why are we supposed to care about a Pokemon that belongs to a character that doesn't even have a name, unique sprite, nor does she ever even mention the purloin? Why not just make it Hugh's purloin? We know Hugh. We might not like him very much, but it's at least easier to sympathize with the person who's trying to rescue a Pokemon that has significance to him, not the sister we don't know. The whole thing is just stupid to the point of God, I don't care. I cannot care about a purloin that belongs to a girl that I don't know or care about. So if I've got so much smack to talk about Gen 5, why is it number one? While Gen 5 fails at a few of its endeavors, it only has so many shortcomings because it attempted to do more than any other Pokemon game before or since. And for all the risks it took, even the ones that didn't pay off so well, the fact that it dares to push the series forward makes it the most interesting Pokemon generation to date. I love a game that makes me think. I love that Pokemon took itself and its fans seriously enough to challenge them, and even challenge their own loyalty to the franchise. 
And what's more, the gameplay didn't suffer to make room for such an involved story. It was still fun and worthwhile to raise Pokemon, in fact even more so than in past games. The journey the player goes through with their Pokemon basically never has to end because there's so much to do. There's the Unova Challenge, medals to earn, Pokestar Studios, the Pokemon World Tournament, the Battle Subway, Global Link Tournaments to participate in, a Pokedex to complete, a Habitatless to fill in, Move Tutors, the Entry Link. It has the absolute biggest post game of any Pokemon game to date, including Gen 2. While big, huge, complicated storylines aren't usually something I'm crazy about in RPGs, I felt like this one took the care and effort required to make it a story worth telling. And I really sincerely hope Game Freak tries something like this again in the future. So there you have it, my top 6 Pokemon generations. What do you think is the best generation? Leave me a comment and let me know. Thanks for watching and don't forget to click here to subscribe for more Pokemon videos. See ya!